Hello, and welcome to the session on the latest research and recommendations on climate change with Johannes Eckler. I'm Sienna and I'll be the MC for the session. We'll be starting with a 20 minute talk by Johannes, followed by a live Q&A session where he will be able to respond to some of your questions. You can submit questions by using the box to the right hand side of this video. You can also vote for your favorite questions to push them up higher on the list. Now I would like to introduce our speaker for the session. Johannes Akba leads the climate work at Founders Pledge, where he researches high impact giving opportunities and co-manages their climate fund. Before joining in 2019, he spent five years working in a think tank, advising decision makers on climate policy, and has also researched the intersection between effective and feasible climate policies. Here's Johannes. Yeah, hello everyone. My name is Johannes Akva. I'm with Founders Pledge. In the next 15 minutes or so, I'm going to talk with you about um, how we think about climate change. And really, if I can have to summarize our like top line message on like one slide, then it will be this one. And that's kind of OK. If you think about what you want to do on climate, focus on supporting solutions that have a leverage on global emissions. And kind of the rest of the talk is kind of laying out what does that actually mean? And yeah, first, kind of to, to answer that question, we kind of need to understand what's really the nature, um, the nature of the challenge that we're facing. And I think um, it's useful to think about um, climate not in isolation, but to think about it as a triple challenge, a triple challenge that arose around um, energy production and energy consumption, because like 80% or so of all like um, of all emissions, certainly of all like long-term emissions are ultimately um, related to energy production. And yeah, the first part of the challenge, I guess, is climate change, which we like all know. We're currently on a path to something like three degrees of warming. That's kind of the default, and there's uh, probably something like a one percent degree, a one percent chance of getting to something in more than six degrees. So we're kind of in a situation where this is a very serious problem, and three degrees already would be really quite serious, and six degrees is kind of unimaginably different uh, from the world we're we're living in um, today. Um, but of course, that's really just like one part um, of the challenge, and there are at least like two other important pieces that are kind of connected to this. The first one really is air pollution, uh, which causes about 5 million premature deaths every year, which is like about 9% or so of all premature deaths. And like importantly, this is not all related to fossil fuels, so only about half of those are kind of related to fossil fuels, and the other one are kind of, um, the other air pollution is related to um, in, in particular, indoor cooking uh, with um, with biomass, so it's it's a double-edged sword. But there's certainly like, it's a massive like uh, massive uh, public health um, challenge around energy production revolves around air pollution. And yeah, how important is this? And I guess this is also uh, something where it's really important, and the regional differences are really large. And this is something you can see uh, from this study. Um, which is Sorovnik et al. 2019, which kind of tries to understand um, how much, like if we're, if we're doing like more ambitious climate policy in light of kind of the air pollution consequences, how many million of lives we are, would actually be saved over different um, decades and in different regions. And I've highlighted here um, the four Asian regions that this um, study differentiates. And you can kind of see that like, I guess 90%, sometimes then decreasing to something like 80% or so, of kind of all of the uh, millions of life years saved per year from like stricter climate policy uh, through kind of air pollution benefits are concentrated in Asia. So it's obviously like a major, major uh, factor. And I guess if we look at China also how like um, climate policy is happening in China, like air pollution policy is like a huge part of that. Um, and then there's the third part of the triple challenge, which is um, yeah, energy poverty, which is, I guess, um, about 3 billion people. So almost every second human right now is kind of uh, cooking uh, with biomass. About 1 billion people don't have access uh, to electricity. It's estimated in India alone, it's about 100 million people uh, without access to electricity. And of course, those are just like those numbers just mask much wider, much more widespread, real severe energy poverty. And we do know that it's very clear the relationship between like um, access to energy and economic development. So the direction is not necessarily just in one uh, causal direction, but it's very clear that uh, economic development, increased life quality and access to energy are very tightly related. So we definitely need to plan if, if the world is going to get richer to plan for a world with more energy and also 
from a humanitarian or ethical perspective, we also kind of shouldn't discourage um, energy use. And yeah, that kind of uh, says something about the solutions that we should try to find uh, the very best climate opportunities, both giving opportunities, but also probably other opportunities, career opportunities, etc. Uh, solve for much more uh, than just climate and they kind of deal with this tension that exists between like climate and air pollution on the one hand and like air, um, energy poverty um, on the other hand like in a, in a productive fashion or that kind of try to solve climate and air pollution in a way that does not jeopardize increased uh, energy access um, for um, for the world's poor. Um, so this is kind of I guess how we in Fun Respect think about the triple challenge. And then uh, the question, of course, arises, where are we kind of at in addressing that challenge? And yeah, for, for the most part, the answer is um, we're not doing uh, very well. Uh, so this is uh, energy growth over time. And you can see here from 1800 to like 2017. And the share of low carbon energy, which you kind of can see is the large last 15% or so, has actually barely increased over the last 20 or 30 years. Um, and that's because um, progress in solar and wind has mostly been eaten up by a loss of like relative loss of like nuclear power. So um, energy demand has exploded. The share of low carbon energy is kind of barely increasing. At this rate, decarbonization will take centuries. And of course, if you look at climate science, we don't have uh, centuries. And yeah, we can also see that the geography uh, of that is clearly shifting so that while like historically speaking uh, Western Europe and North America are kind of responsible for climate change by and large and that's like still true in terms of historical uh, emissions the, the picture is shifting in the sense that uh, like right now kind of about 50 percent or so um, of emissions are from the Asia Pacific region and that trend is also going to intensify. And that's also like a key part, uh, a key fact we need to be aware of when we think about effective climate solutions. And yeah, this is kind of how we summarize the challenge ultimately, where we're at, where we need to go. So again, this is a bit simplified kind of to the core challenge. So the gray here is uh, carbon emitting energy, the green is low carbon or zero carbon energy. This is where kind of where we are at right now. So like about 10 to 15% uh, low carbon energy, and this is kind of where we uh, sorry, where we need to go. So like we need to kind of go like a situation where we're doubling or so the energy uh, total energy production by the end of the century, given that we're going to add like two or three million people, and that many people are going to be uh, hopefully uh, richer uh, than they are now, essentially. But essentially, need to get to zero with regards to emissions by 2050 or so, and then go to net negative. So this kind of gives you an idea of the vastness of that challenge. And yeah, that kind of raises the question, okay, this challenge is really vast. What can we actually do as individuals? Should we just be hopeless or are there actually things that we can do? Yeah, and yeah, uh, at Toronto Splash, we strongly believe there's lots we can do. There's a very hopeful message. We just have to be smart about what we're doing. And we need to particularly focus on solutions that have global leverage so that can kind of deal with the situation of this global picture and that also that are like bold solutions because like making small incremental changes to the current trajectory will not be very helpful. And <clears throat> yeah, there are a couple of those um, solutions that kind of in principle satisfy this condition like strategies we can pursue uh, philanthropically you know, or for activism, etc. Leverage that we can push that in principle have this global um, potential and we currently think as probably like the most effective strategy though we should always be open to changing our minds about that uh, to pursue as a philanthropist is kind of focusing um, on energy innovation or energy innovation advocacy more clearly and yeah we believe that this can be highly impactful because it works in a world of rising energy demand and in a world of low coordination in the world where appetite for climate policy is ultimately finite is limited and in that world, still energy um, innovation kind of works as a strategy. And of course, you can ask yourself, like, why should we focus on this now? Isn't it way too late to focus on energy innovation? I think that's a typical uh, criticism. And the reason to focus um, on energy innovation right now, or to kind of focus on that strategy more generally, is that kind of the, the challenge that I laid, laid out before essentially means we need to go to zero emissions uh, or near zero emissions across all 
um, all economic sectors. But right now we're kind of living uh, in a world where there's at least a quarter or so of emissions that are in hard to decarbonize sectors, where right now our solutions to decarbonizing them are very primitive, either whether they're expensive or not available or not scalable, etc. So those are things like iron and steel and cement, which are, I guess, key, especially like for, for emerging economies where a lot of new infrastructure is constructed, but and also otherwise, but like in general, like these are like key challenges, other challenges around aviation and shipping, hard to decarbonize because you need a lot of energy density. Uh, and then also uh, load following electricity. So that means uh, electricity that you can easily uh, turn on and off. It can kind of complement renewables. So renewables, intermittent renewables are doing well, but they kind of are not everything. So and then that else, other piece is also something that's kind of hard to decarbonize. So that's kind of the picture. And if you kind of look at um, the picture, this is now from the International Energy Agency, uh, if you kind of go a bit more nuanced, not only what is hard to decarbonize, but what is kind of on track, kind of see that almost nothing is on track. So like seven out of 39 technologies that the International Energy Agency considers as like essential for a climate solution are on track. Um, and most of them need more effort or are not on track. But among those that are on track, you can see a couple of um, technologies we all know and we all love. So like there's solar PV here, there's rail here, there's electric vehicles here, energy storage here, lighting here. So those are technologies I think that we all know and that are success stories we talk about a lot. And I think that's kind of no coincidence. That's another kind of key part. So success or the fact that those technologies have succeeded uh, is not a coincidence. Uh, many of those technologies have been like widely popular for a long time long before they were viable. So like, I guess, um, solar and wind have been have been popular since the 1970s, uh, at least, even though they've kind of become valid, viable as energy technologies in the 2010s or so. Um, and they have been the uh, target of significant policy support through innovation policies and deployment subsidies. So we have spent hundreds of billions on we look at the policymakers, uh, jurisdictions, countries like Germany or jurisdictions like California, I spent hundreds of billion, uh, hundreds of billions to kind of make those technologies um, feasible, to drive down the cost and to kind of make them into the global success stories. And that's kind of, I guess, the, the basic way to to generate success. But this requires, like, we we kind of need to move away from only focusing on those technologies where we have already uh, had success, but we require we require more attention to neglected. Uh, technologies. So other technologies that are kind of key of the puzzle, that are needed, that are behind, but they don't receive the same amount of support, uh, policy support and other support than solar and electric cars have received. Uh, this graph really shows this. So this is like philanthropic spending uh, in the United States per uh, megaton of averted uh, tons, kind of based on like global, global decarbonization model. So it's kind of trying to relate how neglected, philanthropically speaking, are different solutions. And you can kind of see that for um, for every dollar or so that we're, that we're spending on the carbon capture and storage, which is like one very neglected technology, um, we're spending more than 100-fold, like more than 200-fold on like solar and wind, and then similarly light duty transport, forestry, energy efficiency. So there are a couple of solutions that receive lots and lots of attention. Uh, and then there are others that are kind of uh, neglected, heavy duty transport, carbon capture and storage, advanced nuclear, industrial decarbonization. All of those receive almost no uh, philanthropic support. And that's of course, um, that's of course like a major, major problem when if, if you think that those technologies are the one that kind of need to go the furthest going forward. And yeah, essentially kind of the top line message of this is we need to do for an eclectic technology what we have already done for solar and wind. We kind of need to expand um, and kind of focus on those technologies that are neglected so that we can actually get to net zero emissions. Yeah, and again, climate presentations are often depressing, so I kind of want to close that part also again on a positive note. And the positive note is here that we can actually, as individuals, make a lot of difference on this. If we kind of focus on giving, if we focus our philanthropy on options through which we can create lots of leverage. And that's what we call um, audacious advocacy, which is the underlying theory behind the climate fund that we just launched, to which you can give through EA funds, and also behind all of our top recommended charities, the Clean Air Task Force, Carbon 180, and Terra Praxis. 
And uh, what that actually means, like audacious advocacy, is that, okay, you give to organizations that are involved in advocacy that are driving policy change and not any kind of policy, but ideally policy that is focused on driving down the cost of infected technologies, either for like early deployment or like basic R&D or whatever it is, different options for different technologies. You drive down the cost to make those technology better. And then you kind of get to the situation of global scaling. And that is kind of, I think, the most plausible way that like giving uh, can kind of have a huge, uh, huge impact and like can be extremely cost effective because you're kind of leveraging both policy, uh, you're leveraging policy and then you're leveraging innovation. So you're kind of answering, um, answering the challenge in a way that's actually like a plausible way to solve um, this challenge, to contribute to solving this challenge. Strategy. And this other strategy um, that I want to talk about uh, is policy leadership. And policy leadership is really about domino effects uh, inspiring other countries. Maybe there's one exception to this, which could be China, because China is so large in terms of emissions that uh, improving policy in China can kind of be highly effective just on its own. But if you're in a smaller country, then always kind of the main benefit of, um, of policy leadership is really inspiring other countries to adopt uh, similar policies or become similarly ambitious. And yeah, I kind of want to zoom in on policy leadership uh, by emerging economies. And I think there are a couple of like characteristics that combine uh, those different economies that make this a good case that there can be like policy leadership and policy learning across uh, the region. First, um, the very serious uh, trade-offs that I talked about between energy poverty and climate action. But on the other hand, there's also really positive complementarities between dealing with air pollution uh, and climate action. A second, there's like lots of new fossil infrastructure. So right, like a lot of like fossil infrastructure in China, for example, has been built in the last 20 years. So a lot of infrastructure, it's very new, which makes this challenge very different from like decarbonizing in Europe, where you can just wait to the end of the life uh, of those plants. Um, also, of course, there's like growing demand for energy and emission intensive industrial goods. Uh, also, and that's very much on the positive side, there's very active industrial policy and appreciation for like state-led innovation. And of course, uh, all of those uh, all of the countries uh, are facing a Western mainstream on climate that often kind of downplays the need for more energy and it's often focused on a very narrow uh, subset of solutions. So like these are like, of course, this is a simplification, but just trying to like get at like a couple of characteristics of many emerging um, economies in the Asia Pacific um, region, where kind of the way, in a way that the way that I think about it is like the this is kind of a very different uh, cluster, and uh, so there's a lot more. It's like more, more, more plausible that there can be like a lot of like, policy leadership locally than um, necessarily than like across very different um, countries. So, for example, like uh, Sweden right now has a carbon tax of a hundred dollars per ton of carbon. That's I don't think that this will inspire many countries in the Asia Pacific region uh, at this point. So what uh, can we actually do in just some very like tentative ideas and obviously like I'm not an Asia uh, Pacific expert, be very clear about this and it's just kind of very first step at starting a conversation. Uh, I guess in terms of activism and philanthropy, uh, searching for solutions that maximize public health benefits and that minimize the adverse effects uh, on energy access. So yeah, find solutions is kind of uh, qualified for that. And yeah, do let us know if you think if there are great underfunded uh, philanthropic um, opportunities. Of course, in terms of careers, climate careers, what can one do? Uh, yeah, I currently think that probably like uh, if you're in the region, more so than if you're in Europe, um, because emissions in Europe are pretty predetermined. Uh, consultancy and think tank work might really be the most prominent and might be a great rule, uh, great route to kind of have a lot of uh, impact, uh, but do pay close attention, I think, to to alignment. So, for example, I just looked at Greenpeace East Asia a couple of days ago, and yet yeah, their their approach to solving the climate challenge again is like very anti-nuclear, just focus on renewables, energy efficiency. So, um, while they look like a very prominent actor uh, in this space, they don't really, I guess, the contribution uh, that they're making is not not very aligned with uh, what I talked about. Uh, where I think the, the best kind of routes to making progress are. And then, of course, uh, networking. And I talked uh, particularly to uh, two EAs, which, uh, which are working a lot on um, 
I guess climate and, uh, and different aspects of this, like Finn, uh, Finn Heide, who also helped me with the slide. He's a Germany-based EA, but he's kind of very interested in the intersection of uh, climate and, in his case, in particular, China. So do get in touch with him on that. And then Wei, Wei Dehi, which I'm sure I pronounced wrong now, uh, she's based in Singapore. Uh, she's, I guess, an EA who's very focused or focused on environmentalism effective environmentalism and also kind of on um, in careers in that space. She does, she says she doesn't have specific insight on on that in the region, but in any case, um, she's happy uh, to chat as well. And of course, also feel free uh, to reach um, reach out to me. Uh, the key takes away, takeaways that I kind of want to summarize is that um, climate is deeply interwoven with other causes. So there's this triple challenge. Impactful climate philanthropy is about leverage and global emissions. Uh, and the various strategies to achieve that. So I talked to two about about two of them today. Uh, policy leadership, mostly kind of on the focus on today, mostly with a focus on careers, but of course there also might be philanthropic options. Uh, and then um, energy innovation, where I mostly talked about um, our top charities in that space. Yes, and with that, I'm looking forward to answering your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you for that talk, Johannes. I see we've had a number of questions submitted. So let's go with the first one. So what are your thoughts on increasing usage of geothermal energy as an effective climate change intervention in the Asia Pacific countries like Philippines and Indonesia? Both countries are currently in top five geothermal producers already. Yeah, so absolutely uh, in favor uh, of that. So like geothermal is like a great, uh, great source, a great renewable source, because it's like kind of it's a non-intermittent renewable source, which makes it like much more useful uh, from an energy perspective than like an intermittent source like solar or wind. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so that's like huge potential. Um, also want to kind of point out that there's like um, research and development kind of to make geothermal more generally available geographically, uh, which is something like what's called super hot uh, rock geothermal, which is something that the Clean Air Task Force uh, is ad actively advocating for. So that's very much on, on top of our Mine's very much something we try to uh, facilitate with our recommendations. Okay, great. Thank you for that. Um, can we move on to the next question? Um, how well do nature-based solutions like rewilding and strengthening ecology in general fare in your analysis? Uh, biodiversity is also linked to decreasing air and water pollution and healthy fish stocks, for example. Um, uh, they are very important for livelihoods of millions of people, as well as reducing CO2. Yeah, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think in general, whether something is natural or technological kind of shouldn't matter so much as it matters. It's more, it seems more like, a, uh, it's just like people like things that are natural, but there's not really a reason to think it's better. Uh, but that like, but it's also, there's also no reason to think it's worse, right? So we should not prefer technology for the sake of it. Um, I think there's, there's two, like there, there's great potential generally with like uh, natural solutions for like um, carbon sequestration, carbon removal, uh, there are, I think, two kinds of problems with this. One is kind of, um, there's a lot of potential for those solutions, kind of, but there's really hard to set up policies that incentivize that because this requires kind of the participation of millions of people, uh, like farmers, et cetera, around the world. So that makes this very hard uh, as a solution. And the other thing, the other like reason or one, or one needs to be worried about there is kind of the permanence of um, storage. Um, but I guess like all solutions have to have down, downsides. So like this does not mean we shouldn't focus on that. It's more like these are the downsides with natural solutions. And uh, I guess, yeah, one of the charities I highlighted, Carbon 180, uh, is essentially focused on everything that's about carbon removal, both kind of the high tech end of it, but also kind of the low tech natural solutions piece of it. So they're working on those solutions as well. Okay, great. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I think something with our psyche kind of goes with natural solutions, but um, thanks for clarifying that. I think that's an important uh, point to make. Yeah, um, we don't have heaps of time, so I will go into the next question um, quickly. Uh, in your view, what are the greatest barriers to putting price on carbon? And what could EAs do to quicken the process, given that it is an, an effective mechanism for speeding up the technological implementation rate? There's so much in this question, and I worked in carbon pricing for four years uh, before joining Founders Pledge. Uh, and so much in this question, I would not agree with. So, like, um, carbon pricing is great when you have the goal of reducing emissions in your country 
for the short term a little bit. It's not at all obvious that it's the best solution if you're focusing on uh, driving global decarbonization. Um, so that's kind of something I want to say before. So I think it's sometimes a bit overhyped, uh, but still very good. Uh, what's the best thing um, that people can do that very much, that's very country specific. So I spent the summer researching carbon pricing um, in the US and kind of came out of, okay, we're, the politics for an ambitious carbon price are just not there. So maybe that's not something to focus on. Situation is different in other countries. There's a lot of momentum uh, in Europe you can kind of support effective organizations in that space. But I'd be, I, I, I'm pretty convinced that this is not the most effective thing you can do. It's something you can do, but I'm pretty sure that focusing on kind of um, innovation focused uh, charities or generally improving energy innovation is the more valuable um, activity if you have to make the choice. Do you have an opinion on the Asia Pacific region um, or is that more on, like work to scope out? On carbon pricing in the Pacific region, Asia Pacific region? I mean, China has um, an emission trading system. Uh, Singapore, I think, is also working on those things. Korea has an ETS. Um, I think this can be helpful, but I think we should um, not fool ourselves that this will be like the major or the only solution kind of driving progress. And the reason for that is that many parts of the Asia Pacific regions, there's like very, like it's quite, make, makes a lot of sense to expect that energy demand will grow over time. And that's like a good thing. And in a setting like that, you're not, you'll be very surprised if you like get a strong carbon pricing uh, policy. Um, and I think that's what we see in China, right? China setting up an ETS, but it's kind of so toothless in a way um, that it's like, like it exists, but will not be the major driver of Chinese decarbonization. Yeah. Yeah, I think you've made a good case for the, um, where EA should direct their efforts um, and to get the best results. So yeah, thank you for that. Um, unfortunately, we are out of time. I will mention that Johannes will be giving a talk on November the 30th, um, so next week focusing especially on the charity work that he mentioned in his talk. So please head over to effectivegivingday.org um, to check it out because he's doing some interesting work. Um, thanks so much, Johannes, for this talk and thank you for watching, everyone.